Ladies and gentlemen, online viewers worldwide, welcome to the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate Lecture in Biopharmaceutical Science. 2020 was a year marked by unprecedented challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. While the pandemic has put most things on hold, our endeavors in gathering the Tang Prize Laureates in Biopharmaceutical Science to highlight the importance of groundbreaking research and innovation in biopharmaceutical science have not been reduced. Now, please join me to welcome Dr. Zhang Wenchang, Chair of the Tang Prize Selection Committee for Biopharmaceutical Science to introduce the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate. Dr. Zhang, please. It's my great honor to introduce the three laureates of the 2020 Tom Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science to you for their contribution to the development of cytokine targeting biological therapies for the treatment of inflammatory diseases. Doctors Charles Dinareno, Mark Federman, and Tadamizu Kishimoto. The second laureate, Dr. Mark Feidman, received his medical degree at the University of Melbourne, and now he is a professor emeritus at the University of Oxford. He demonstrated that the inflammatory joints have more pro-inflammatory cytokines and identify one of these tumor necrosis factor alpha TNF-alpha, he then used tnf blocker antibody to successfully verify the drug efficacy in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis in a series of clinic trials. This discovery led to the development of therapeutics, including Humira and Emperor, in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Today, Anti-TNF biologics have become a standard therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, as well as multiple autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Federman. It's a pleasure to give this lecture in honor of the Tang Prize. Um, this is a major prize and for me, was a real pleasure to get to be awarded it this year, uh, 20 years after we received our first prize. Um, it signifies to me and my colleagues that the discoveries we have made have been important now for a generation. What I want to do in this talk is really cover uh, my life story in science, um, how I developed the skills needed how these were developed into effective therapy and how this changed the therapeutic landscape and how to fill the gaps in treatment. In my emeritus career, uh, I'm doing a lot of work to try and develop new drugs. My research career started uh, after I finished medicine. I went um, to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, a famous institute of rheumatology where the autoimmune diseases were discovered by the previous director, Sir Frank McFarlane Burnett. I was supervised by the director at the time, Gus Nossel and Erwin Dina. And my initial project was uh, how to optimize uh, cell culture so that you could get immune responses outside the body in the test tube. But importantly, I learned how to work effectively with others. And throughout my career, uh, that has been a hallmark, finding talented people to work with and together with them, achieving much more than we could alone. My most uh, long-standing collaborator is Sir Ravinda Maney, uh, but very important also was Fanula Brennan, um, Dr. Michael Shepard, and uh, Captain James Woody. Uh, regrettably, Professor Brennan has died, but I've been working with these others uh, for 30 to 40 years. So in my PhD, 
I developed the skill sets and the interest that enabled me to develop anti-TNF therapy. What I did as a student was to optimize the culture of uh, immune cells from mouse spleen, learned that they could be separated, they didn't have to touch each other, and traveling between T cells and B cells were active molecular mediators. And studying this project led me to uh, understand the importance of intercellular mediators, what we could call now cytokines, of which the one that we have studied the most, TNF, is a member of this family. And uh, so my uh, uh, longest project was translating insights into autoimmunity into effective therapy. Um, this has been described in uh, a number of reviews especially in annual reviews of immunology at 2009. Here is summarized some of the key points of how anti-TNF was discovered as a therapeutic target. Um, I'll show you in the next slide a new idea I developed in 1983 on the mechanism of autoimmune diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis was a good member of autoimmune diseases to study. The tissue where the disease is, is accessible, so it can be studied. It's a common disease, many patients, and a big unmet need. And my collaborator on the right is an eminent academic rheumatologist, and we've worked together since 1984. These diseases are inflammatory, and the key of our hypothesis is which molecular mediator, which cytokine was important. So we had to measure which ones were present in the diseased tissue. And the most uh, uh, important person for giving us many tools is shown on the left, Michael Shepard. He was at Genentech and gave us materials for studying TNF and other molecules. And once we knew which cytokines were present uh, measured by measuring messenger RNA, we could also confirm it by another technique, immunohistology, and then study the process further. So this was an important step in our breakthrough, developing a new idea for the mechanism of autoimmunity. This was published, uh, and the publication is shown on the right, in The Lancet in 1983, together with colleagues. And it focuses on the role of uh, aberrant HLA-DR molecules and antigen presentation. Shown on the left is a little scheme of how this may work. If you have excess class two, this will present autoantigens uh, and uh, this uh, would lead to T cell activation, production of cytokines, Inst activation of, of B cells by T cells, producing autoantibodies and tissue damage, and so a vicious cycle of autoimmunity. Each of these steps could be tested, and despite the fact that we published our idea in, uh, without any data, very quickly we were able to assemble the important data to substantiate this idea um, and to demonstrate it, that the cellular components, uh, the activated antigen presentation, the T cells activating B cells were all present in autoimmune disease tissue. What we, and this was all done by studying tissue from thyroid disease. What we could not study was the molecular messengers. And for that, we changed to studying a rheumatoid arthritis. And the reason for it is that uh, thyroid tissue is only removed um, at surgery when the disease is quiescent, but uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, can be uh, studied in its active state. And my colleague for the initial testing of this hypothesis is shown here, uh, Dr. Marco Londo. For studying rheumatoid arthritis, this was the start of a collaboration with Ravinda Maney. 
the first postdoc involved was um, Dr. Glenn Buchan, and he perfected the techniques which enabled us to catalogue very many uh, pro-inflammatory mediators in the joint. As well, he could detect uh, anti-inflammatory mediators, chemotactic cytokines, growth factors. And with this plethora of active molecules in rheumatoid uh, disease tissue, the key question, were any of these going to be effective therapeutic targets? By therapeutic target, I mean, if they are blocked, would this have an impact on the disease? And many workers believe that if you had so many active molecules, blocking a single one could not work. However, we persevered in trying to find which, if any, of these cytokines was really important. And the approach that we used was one developed from my PhD skills. We put operative samples of rheumatoid synovium, dissociate the cells and put these in tissue culture. And with phenylabrenin, we optimized how to keep these cells alive, as shown on this panel. So they kept on producing inflammatory mediators like interleukin-1 for uh, almost a week. And this provided a test bed where we could add at the beginning of a culture various uh, tools, antibodies to TNF or lymphotoxin, and ask which of any of these may have a dramatic impact. And as you can see here, anti-TNF switched off the production of a different inflammatory mediator, interleukin-1. And this was the first clue, an experiment performed by Professor Brennan, a postdoc at the time, that TNF was our therapeutic target. This is true in autoimmune tissue, but in uh, degenerative arthritis, uh, anti-TNF does not block the production of interleukin-1. So we had... Um, in 1988, a new concept that TNF was at the uh, head of a therapeutic cascade, that the TNF drove the production of many uh, inflammatory mediators, pro-inflammatory ones like IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, and anti-inflammatory mediators as well. And so this was our pivotal uh, potential therapeutic target. Uh, this was developed from tissue culture studies, and as these at times do not necessarily produce the right results, we had to check this out in animal models uh, before we could contemplate clinical studies. And the results um, um, were quite clear cut. We were fortunate to obtain uh, antibodies against mouse TNF from a friend, Bob Schreiber in St. Louis, and my colleague, Richard Williams, was an expert in inflammatory arthritis in the mouse. And so the results obtained are shown here, but if one gives anti-TNF after the onset of inflammation, um, this, depending on the dose, has stabilized the disease uh, quite effectively. This was... Uh, a higher dose, a lower dose, but a very low dose had no effect, and in green is without any antibody. So two different doses of anti-TNF uh, reduced the inflammation in uh, a mouse model of arthritis. Uh, this is measuring swelling. It doesn't look as dramatic as looking at it under the microscope. This is a normal joint. This is the anti-TNF treated joints, and they look quite different to the untreated joints where you can see a lot of inflammatory cells and the cartilage damage. So this was a very satisfactory test of our idea that anti-TNF alone would be sufficient to have a big impact on an inflammatory disease with many mediators. And so the next challenge was to obtain anti-TNF to test our hypothesis. Um, 
um, this we knew was uh, uh, had been made. Tony Cerami, a, a brilliant biochemist in New York, had shown that uh, bacterial sepsis in mice was curable by anti-TNF. And so many companies had made anti-TNF monoclonal antibodies. So we approached local companies in the UK that had such antibodies uh, without any success. However, uh, my friend, when my friend James Woody, an ex-student, joined Centercore, a small biotech in uh, Philadelphia that had worked with Jan Vilcek and, uh, to produce a monoclonal antibody to TNF and convert it from mouse to human, uh, we could start our clinical studies. And the clinical studies were very lengthy. They started in May 1992 in our hospital in uh, London with uh, Ravinda Maney and myself as the key uh, investigators for the first proof of principle trial. But um, this was um, followed by other trials, a, bl a blinded trial, multiple dose trial, and then registration trials. Uh, and these uh, uh, took uh, many years with approval finally in 1998, which actually uh, in retrospect is relatively quick. Um, not that many drugs go from uh, initial discovery of a target to clinical use in 10 years. Uh, uh, and here below, are some of the key clinicians that worked with us. The key clinical trial, the formal proof of principle, the double-blind trial is shown here. Uh, two different doses of antibody or a control serum albumin. And uh, uh, you can see that the control swollen joint nut count numbers, uh, swollen joints are very easy to measure marker of inflammation. This doesn't change, but with both doses of anti-TNF, a rapid drop uh, in the number of inflamed joints and an even more rapid drop in inflammatory protein CRP. This was a time when the clinical trials were being, um, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis were being developed and the um, combined criteria were being developed by a rheumatologist in uh, Los Angeles, Harold Paulus, and his criteria turned out to work very well. Under placebo, only 8% made, made, met his guidelines. At the high dose, it was essentially 80%. You don't get a much bigger difference in a clinical trial than this. So we had our formal proof of principle that anti-TNF was affected. But in this study, it was quite short term. And four weeks in the lifetime of a patient with um, perhaps a lifelong time disease was insufficient. And so we had to learn how to deliver uh, this therapy long term. And the approach which we took was to fill an unmet need at the time uh, this is the mid 90s, the most effective anti-rheumatic drug was the um, repurposed cancer drug, methotrexate, a use at much lower dose than in cancer was effective in rheumatoid arthritis. However, for at least half patients, there was no response. And this green line shows that these patients in our trial were not responsive uh, to methotrexate alone. However, if they were given uh, a, a number of different doses of um, anti-TNF, here a low dose, 30% responded for a short period of time. With a higher dose, three milligrams per kilogram, about 30 to 40% responded uh, for many months uh, and roughly the same at 10 milligrams. But what we learned from this study was the power of combining two different anti-inflammatory drugs, anti-TNF with methotrexate. The methotrexate non-responders 
when coupled with the anti-TNF treatment, gave you this line, a very a robust a response of more than half of the patients responding by more than 50%. And so this combination of uh, treatments became state of the art, and this is the use of the current uh, average dose of infliximab in rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, for this discovery, uh, my institute uh, used to get royalties on this patent, and I labeled it a use patent because uh, we did not invent the anti-TNF molecule, but we invented the most appropriate use. So we now had, um, by the um, late 90s, evidence that anti-TNF was effective in rheumatoid arthritis in the majority of patients, had a very effective effect. And um, as academics, the key question was, uh, how did this actually work? Did this actually work according to the way we had predicted, or was there some other mechanism? And so we measured what we thought should be happening, a reduced production of other cytokines, and what's shown here is the fact that anti-TNF treatment, a single injection, very rapidly diminishes the level of interleukin-6, as shown here. Uh, this happens in a matter of hours with either high dose, oops, high dose or low dose uh, anti-TNF. And so this was a formal proof that in vivo, the blockade of TNF rapidly reduces the production of other inflammatory mediators. We we're also interested in the mechanism in other ways. This was the molecular mechanism as uh, shown by effect on other cytokines, but we're also interested to see what happened to inflammatory cells. And as you can see, lots of inflammatory cells in the joints of the hand before anti-TNF and a dramatic reduction two weeks after anti-TNF. So these mechanisms, the, the blockade of the cytokine cascade and the reduced recruitment of inflammatory cells is the reason why now uh, anti-TNF is used in about 15 different diseases. The results I've shown you were all done in late-stage rheumatoid arthritis. And what we had seen is that whereas half, more than half the patients responded by 50%, uh, much less than that responded by 70%, and none responded by 100%. In other words, there was no cures. But a group of... Um, Dutch rheumatologist led by Ferry Breedveld, our colleague, studied very early rheumatoid arthritis, treating it as we had developed with uh, anti-TNF and fliximab together with methotrexate. And they showed dramatically better results. They showed that uh, some patients were cured, about 20%, but uh, very many patients responded at 70%. And so treating rheumatoid arthritis very early is a much better way than we do at the moment. And it tells us that uh, we can actually improve on our standard treatments. And symbolically representing it, uh, we, we never, we've done some progress. The glass is half full, but it's still half empty we've got a long way to go before every patient is cured. And uh, just to summarize the clinical problems we uh, have, not all patients respond, we've discussed that. Uh, no cures at the moment, there are some side effects and the cost of therapy is such that not everybody was treated. However, anti-TNF has been a great success these patients common in the 80s are no longer are present uh, in our hospitals. Uh, we treat the disease much better. And the key question is, um, how can we get closer to a cure? 
and the there are a number of opportunities we've already discussed treating very early in the disease process however that's very challenging to do in our commercially based medical system um, everybody wants to make sure that the cheap drugs are not sufficient and if you do that then you lose the early window of opportunity another approach that we've been studying is combination therapy and i'll just briefly show you some examples and i'll show you our latest approach which is to not block all of tnf but block one of the two receptors uh, this is um, a study to show that if we uh, combine uh, anti-TNF with a different treatment with the blockage of blood vessels, we have a very uh, important new therapy. This is blocking vessels very extensively, which is uh, possible uh, only in mice. But in humans, if we add a, um, a partial blockade of vessels with partial blockade of anti-TNF, we get a very dramatic enhancement. Regrettably, this combination therapy of blocking uh, vessel formation through the blockade of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor uh, has never been tested. It could be tested with monoclonal antibodies to VEGF, but the cost would be prohibitive. And so that approach has not progressed for the moment. Uh, another approach is to block the uh, function of the synovial fibroblasts and uh, this is a project that my colleague uh, Yoshi Ito has studied for a number of years uh, published a few years ago and it's combining um, a, a drug which blocks the migration of fibroblasts um, anti-MMP um, with uh, anti-TNF and you can see there is a big a big uh, improvement in the treatment compared to either one alone. Again, this strategy is not uh, ready for commercial development. Um, it's based on uh, two monoclonals, which is certainly not cost effective. But I've shown to tell you that uh, there are approaches to improvement and we have to optimize which approaches will work. Uh, the approach to improving uh, the response to anti-TNF that we are following up is to block one of the two receptors for TNF on cells. TNF is a very unusual mediator because it has two different targets, TNF receptor 1, which drives inflammation, and TNF receptor 2, which does the very opposite. So if you block all of TNF, you block both receptors, you block inflammation, but you also prevent the attempt of the body to dampen down the inflammation. We are in the process of generating um, um, tools that will enable us to block TNF receptor one. Here is shown some experiments in mice, which demonstrate that the blockage of TNF receptor one is just as effective at the beginning as blocking TNF, but more effective long-term than blocking TNF alone. And the reason for this in mice can be documented. It's because when one blocks TNF receptor one alone, then there is no change in the function of regulatory T cells. So this approach, I think, will yield uh, better benefit and is uh, being clinically uh, developed uh, at the moment. The very uh, marked success of anti-TNF therapy being effective not only in rheumatoid arthritis but in other diseases had an unexpected effect. It's accelerated the therapeutic revolution. Before anti-TNF, monoclonal antibodies was seen as a niche product, not really a mainstream best-selling drug. And uh, this totally changed 
with anti-TNF. Um, since, um, since multiple TNFs, anti-TNFs were approved from 98 to 92, they grew in sales so that by 2012, uh, anti-TNF was the biggest drug class. And so the revolution in the use of monoclonal antibodies and the interest of the pharmaceutical companies was triggered initially by anti-TNF. Now it's sustained not only by anti-TNF and other anti-inflammatory drugs, anti-R6, anti-R1223, uh, but also by anti-cancer drugs. And my friend, Michael Shepard, uh, that uh, uh, is, was the person who uh, invented the first anti-cancer drug, Herceptin. And here is Jen Allison, uh, who got a Nobel Prize and a Tank Prize for his work on immunotherapy of cancer. So the antibody revolution uh, continues. Uh, there are more different uh, interesting types of antibodies, um, and uh, that will continue for some time. In the last um, nine to 10 years, um, I've become very interested in developing new drugs to fulfill unmet needs. And uh, this has been driven by the fact that uh, drug development uh, has hit uh, many roadblocks. The cost of developing new drugs has become huge. The drugs produced by biotech uh, and pharma, most of these drugs never get tested uh, due to the high failure rate and high costs. And below are some of my pictures from a trip to Antarctica that illustrate quite well some of these roadblocks and uh, not knowing which direction uh, to go to do your best experiment. Uh, and here is the work of my uh, friend, Jack Scannell, which documented that the number of drugs that could be developed uh, per billion dollars went from many drugs to less than one uh, in recent years. And uh, that is why we do need to optimize drug development, which is what I'm devoting my, uh, my uh, uh, current career. And there are many things that could be done better. Uh, optimizing the therapeutic target, we believe hum using human disease tissue provides many clues to disease mechanisms, uh, reducing the cost of making the therapeutics, reducing the cost of clinical trials, all of these will improve drug developments. And in my um, emeritus career, what I'm really doing is uh, treating uh, a number of unmet needs which did not get developed uh, during my regular career uh, only anti-TNF was done, but other projects that might have been promising were not completed. And uh, as I learned how to work with little companies, uh, I've also helped uh, various friends projects. So uh, at the moment, we have uh, a whole set of uh, uh, interesting uh, projects uh, in clinical development, which, we will, uh, which I will describe to you. Uh, at the end as I finish this talk. Uh, this is our oldest um, standing uh, drug development. It's um, a company called 180 Therapeutics that has merged into another with others of our companies. And its goal was to treat fibrosis of the hand uh, with my colleague, Jagdeep Nanchahal. And um, this is done by uh, uh, using anti-TNF um, injection into the palm. And we have completed a clinical trial in this disease, which uh, is uh, in the process of uh, being analyzed. But we have other new uses for anti-TNF in other inflammatory states, a frozen shoulder and uh, post-operative cognitive decline. Frozen shoulder is a very common painful condition uh, and the plan is to inject anti-TNF into the shoulders. 
um, the clinical studies will start uh, in the next few months. And post-operative cognitive decline is a very major problem of old age if people have a major surgery or uh, break their hips very often their mental function is uh, permanently reduced and this can be uh, prevented in mice by treating with anti-TNF and uh, that also will be tested in the next few uh, months starting next few months but it'll take a couple of years before we know uh, when in when I first um, developed anti-TNF uh, and it became available for sale, it was clear that there were two problems with anti-TNF studies. The cost of treatment was very high and this was an injectable drug. And so cheaper drugs that could be delivered by mouth would be uh, able to surpass the benefit and the in the society of anti-TNF. This was a hypothesis that we had made. And of course, every drug company also believes that. And um, it, of course, has taken uh, a long, long time to develop any orally available uh, anti-inflammatories. Uh, but now they are available, for example, the uh, JAK inhibitors like tofacitinib. We started um, uh, looking for orally available anti-inflammatories um, before anti-TNF was approved, but we knew it would be approved in 98. And the first powerful anti-inflammatory anti we picked up was cannabidiol, the work of uh, Rafi Machulam in Israel, brought to our laboratory in London by Ruth Galili on sabbatical. And together we showed that this was a very powerful anti-arthritic drug in mice with arthritis. Um, it can be shown standard ways or visually here. Uh, and so we tried to develop uh, this drug, but we found that the politics of cannabis were impossible. Uh, but we've restarted this project uh, 15 years later. Uh, in 2018, and we're now in the process of developing synthetic uh, cannabinoids with new patents as orally available anti-inflammatories and, and analgesic drugs. Uh, we're in a company called Canbiorex. One of the world's uh, biggest problems is neurodegeneration. And with my friend and colleague, Laura Dugan, uh, we are studying uh, catalytic fullerene-based antioxidants. Um, these are um, very useful in neurodegeneration. Shown here is the brain of a normal macaque monkey. Uh, if it's given uh, MTPT, its, it's uh, dopaminergic neurons uh, are damaged. But if it's treated with uh, this fullerene antioxidant, the uh, monkeys recover by more than 80%, as shown here. This is the progression of symptoms, and this is the reversal by the drug. Um, and these are classic scores as used in humans. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully this drug will enter trials uh, in Parkinson's and later on in Alzheimer's within two years. When one of the big problems in human diseases is the fact that our stem cells do not repair as well as those in other species. In some species like starfish and salamander, uh, repair of uh, chopped off limbs is very rapid. In humans, uh, there have been attempts to use stem cells for many years and this has not been successful. With my colleague Jagdeep Nanchahal has discovered a new way to trigger a repair of tissues in the multiple organs. Um, he has found a common pathway 
which is triggered by the nuclear protein HMGB1, which was released in cell injury. This complexes with a chemokine CXCL12, and this complex binds to this receptor CXCR4. And this uh, uh, overcomes the challenges of stem cell therapies because what this HMGB1 does is to trigger the endogenous stem cells that we all have. And in mice, this accelerates the repair of bone, accelerates the repair of blood, accelerates the repair of skeletal muscle and also of heart muscle. And so we are setting up a company to set up to study the role of HMGB1 in repair of many tissues in humans. And uh, I've already told you um, that uh, blocking TNF receptor 1 may be better than blocking TNF. Uh, we have set up a company, Inosi, with my friend Michael Shepard um, to study this. And uh, this is a second generation anti-TNF, just blocks TNF receptor 1, as uh, shown here, unlike TNF blockers, which block both. And uh, uh, we uh, hope that this will be in clinical trials within two years. Michael Shepard's own work, which led to Alaska Award, was the development of the anti-breast cancer drug Herceptin, and he has designed an improved version, which will also develop within this company uh, called Inosi Life Sciences. So in my emeritus career by developing new drugs, uh, we're targeting a lot of unmet needs. But the biggest unmet need of our society, of our world today is COVID-19. And so together with colleagues, we have tried to uh, make a case why TNF blockade would be useful. And uh, uh, this has been extensively published and uh, there is preliminary evidence that uh, uh, anti-TNF does treat and uh, preserve life in uh, many uh, clinical studies. However, big trials uh, have not yet completed. There is a big trial in the US in combination, in anti-TNF in combination with remdesivir and the WHO is running a clinical trial Solidarity Plus of infliximab. And so it's possible that in the future, uh, anti-TNF currently used in about 15 diseases may be also helpful in uh, COVID, the uh, biggest problem we have in the world uh, today. So I've taken you on a tour of my uh, career uh, how I developed uh, and learned new skills uh, that enabled me to develop with, together with uh, colleagues uh, uh, anti-TNF therapy. Uh, these are my mentors that uh, helped uh, set me on my path. These are my important colleagues in development of anti-TNF therapy. And uh, the success in anti-TNF uh, therapy has led me to have the audacity but also the perseverance uh, and the drive to try and set up and uh, new companies to develop new drugs that will also target uh, many unmet needs, uh, heart attacks, pain, neurodegeneration, and other uh, unmet clinical needs. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Feldman, for shedding light on significant breakthroughs in biopharmaceutical science and also research, which has brought about positive and profound impact on mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate Lecture in Biopharmaceutical Science. Thank you all for joining us today. Please stay tuned for the announcement of the 2022 Tang Prize Laureate in Biopharmaceutical Science.